thank you very much. Um, I think it was a wonderful session, symposium, um, at least for people like uh, myself, who is not an expert in the area. Uh, it was sort of an eye-opening in many ways. I think uh, some other colleagues uh, also felt the same way in some, in some, in some um, <coughs> similar context. Um, as we summarize this, uh, we're also going to have another talk uh, during lunch, so there's uh, more to come with respect to uh, this very specific topic. Um, the lunch is set at uh, 12.45, and I don't know if uh, uh, <coughs> the people have already uh, uh, come in here to uh, uh, provide um, uh, the, the lunch so that we can go and get served. Uh, it will be, we'll bring the lunch in here, so you will go out, get the, uh, uh, your, your lunch and then bring it here so as you're listening to the speaker. Um, I just wanted to bring sort of a bigger picture on how I see these things and then I also uh, open the, the floor for more questions until uh, it's about time to go out there and have lunch. As you know, the National Academy is articulating and endorsing and um, uh, sort of a feeling that's very important that we pay a lot of attention to what they call the engineering grand challenges or grand challenges for engineering. There are 14 of them. And if you uh, bucket them in four buckets, they are a bucket on sustainability, a bucket on health, which is personal health, uh, human health, a, a bucket on uh, security, and a bucket on the, enjoy of, the joy of life. The way Dan Mott, the president, uh, advocates these grand challenges is for the continuation of life on the planet as we know it. And, uh, and what we do on section 11, in section 11, I think addresses very much the sustainability part of these four items because the sustainability grand challenges include energy, specifically solar, Second is uh, access to clean water, which was actually the very symposium that we discussed today. The third is on the uh, nitrogen cycle, which relates to uh, Gretchen's sort of a, a work in some way. Uh, and the fourth uh, part of the sustainability there is carbon sequestration, uh, which is another part of uh, the energy uh, related part of sustainability. But if you look at the health of the planet, the way we're describing it now in this symposium, it's sort of sustainability could be in a way the health, the health part, but on a planetary scale kind of thing, if you think about it. I was also, the, our, our section 11 also uh, had identified some its own grand challenges, which are sort of a complementary to the grand challenges for engineering. And two of them are very, uh, very relevant to the discussion we had today. One of the grand challenges is couple phenomena. And the couple phenomena I, th I saw were very much in evidence in Gretchen's talk, coupled the subsurface as well as the surface, as well as a, uh, in uh, uh, Michelle's talk with respect to subsidence, uh, the combination of fluid flow, mechanics, and, and, and transport and all that. And I think that this, uh, uh, this uh, another sort of a grand challenge that the section has articulated and, uh, is transparent Earth. Uh, imagine Google Earth, but in the true sense of Google Earth, in which you can actually understand the subsurface in a very significant way, perhaps at the resolution that right now is not at the level that we, we, we can, we, we, we desire, but in the future perhaps can be at the level that we desire. And many of the questions I think that came about and the issues that, we, that came about address that to some degree. As I mentioned before, the goal of the, 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 the purpose of the academy is to advise the government. And this advice comes after the solicitation from the government itself. So the academy does not advocate uh, any particular solutions it is asked to provide advice. What I find today is that there is an impending, very serious issues that I don't know if the, the, the academy has been asked to provide advice by either the federal agencies or the Congress. 
and that's something that I suppose we have to leave it up to the, to the, to the various agencies and the Congress if they wanted to get advice from the Academy about issues like water. It seems to me that this is too much of a serious issue not for an advice like this to be sought. On the other hand, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not cognizant of the various reports that the Academy has, has issued in this area. Maybe Elizabeth can help us in this since this is part of the Earth Sciences and maybe there are reports and the advice of, of, of the Academy has been sought in this area. Uh, as a result of this type of symposium today, I think that certainly many of us have been educated on how, um, uh, how important it is to act in a very uh, fast and prompt way, specifically uh, by implementing potentially policies and other things that are so important to address significant issues that involve not only water per se, but the nexus of water, energy, and food, which is actually a, a nexus that, that is growing uh, and is interdependent in a much more significant way than ever before. So I think that's something that it is of crucial importance on the sustainability issues. Another thing that the Academy is advocating is, um, not advocating, but uh, uh, is interested in, the public understanding of engineering uh, and how engineering can solve problems or create solutions. And I suppose the management question that was uh, brought up many times about how do you manage uh, situations uh, the, through optimization, control, uh, 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 mitigation, and other things to be able to uh, accomplish so solutions that lead to some sort of a sustainable uh, level. And the second part is how to inspire students and the younger generation to be engaged in problems of this type. And that's actually another important part of how engineering students, uh, uh, you can attract students to engineering and in this particular case in the subsurface side or the water side to understand, for students to understand the importance of being engaged, involved and, and be able to be educated and also try to provide solutions and become the, 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 the change makers or the solutions of the future. And so that is something that is another part that the Academy is very interested in, both at the K through 12 and at the, at the uh, university level, the undergraduate level, and graduate to, to a lesser degree, but certainly at the undergraduate and, and that, which offer, offers an opportunity to increase the flow of, of talented students actually um, um, bring to the engineering and STEM disciplines uh, you know, a diverse number of students uh, that are interested in solving societal problems, not simply do engineering for the sake of engineering on, of, of solving uh, or creating devices and the like. So I think this is, uh, to me, was, is very, uh, very instructive as a, as, a, as, a, as a symposium because it exposes to many different things that, that uh, 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 and identified issues that perhaps need more uh, discussion and more study. Um, my own interest, uh, ex exposure in this, this field is more um, at the subsurface level, but you know, from the pore scale to sort of kilometer scale, here we're talking about you know, <laughs> hundreds of kilometers and square kilometers and the like. We're talking with Khaled, who is an expert in subsurface uh, simulation for, for related to oil and gas. And uh, it's kind of interesting to see that the, 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 the techniques and the technology that they can exist to actually bring together so many different uh, 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 expertise together in, in order to address these very significant problems. Um, but anyway, I don't want to monopolize this. I think we will have the opportunity to do more later on. And so we can actually bring uh, any other questions that, that exist and people wanted to, I think we have maybe 10 or 15 minutes for that. Can I just add something? Let me come up to the microphone. Ah. I just want to emphasize something you just said. But basically, I want to tell you there's no free lunch. Um, as Yanis has said, the, the National Academies are set up to advise governments. But when we talk about these critical issues, there are two parts, I think. One is the collection, dissemination of information. So we can hopefully facilitate or help facilitate the cross-section of, of, of development of technology between the silos. Uh, and, and all of these professional societies tend to be in silos. And then we can disseminate to the public and government. So the challenge for you over lunch, instead of talking about the weather or the election or something, 
help us to come up with what is the next step in this critical issue of water, groundwater, what do you think are the priorities? What should be done in this collection, dissemination of information that perhaps the national academies can do something about? Because we're struggling a little bit to, s to ask, how can we help? I mean, we've got state people here, we've got USGS, we've got government agencies. What can the national academies do to help in this general subject? So over lunch, think about it. And I guess, uh, Yanis, there'll be a chance if they do have some insights, we can hear about them later on. Uh, I also understand that all the material will be available on the web. So this is something, uh, and, and, and of course, you know, we will say it. So everything we said will remain there forever. So when we, we, any of us wants to run for office later on, uh, <laughs> we'll be able to identify the tape <laughs> in which we said something that was not right. <laughs> um, but um, yes, uh, suggestions, feedback is always welcome. Um, Sam had a question. Uh, you already mentioned the importance of water, energy, food mix, uh, nexus. That's, I think, the next step to address that. I was really fascinated to uh, see your slide where the water was pouring out. I have several uh, slides where wire ducts leaks water. It, it's clear from the discussion here that water people, including modelers, need to talk to wastewater people and share the research money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and because um, because the poly I work on spills, spills from oil or impoundment tail, and we, so much water can be wasted. I think we need to talk to each other, the water people and wastewater. I asked uh, somebody in our um, water center, what is the formula for water? I was horrified to hear that H2O, if H2O was the formula for water, the blood in your veins will be boiling. <laughs> My point is that the structure of water, H2O or H2O5, the po it's really polymer, polymerized water, would determine the behavior of water, how it uh, helps the uh, trees and everything. All of these things are connected. We don't look into that. You know, the structure of water is not H2O. <laughs> well, uh, convergence is, uh, is something that is happening everywhere. Uh, for example, engineering, uh, medicine, and the scientists are converging. And this type of convergence that we describe here is clearly something that should be encouraged. Um, you know, m symposiums of this type could f uh, should have been, could have been, uh, maybe in the future will be coordinated with other sections uh, in the academy. For example, section four that deals with uh, surface water for a lot. Yeah. So, so I think uh, I think I have to s speak up for the National Science Foundation. But first of all, you do have a Water Science and Technology Board, Water Science and Technology Board. Elizabeth Ide back there is is now in charge of that, but. Uh, the National Science Foundation, along with the rest of the federal government, is really now um, actually talking exact. We're doing what you're suggesting I we should do. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> try again. Uh, but the, 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 the food energy water nexus has been identified. Uh, it grew organically in the National Science Foundation out of our water sustainability and climate program and our earth systems modeling program. And, uh, but it's, but I mean, agriculture's our, our partner, NEFA is our partner in this, but all of the federal agencies, now energy is doing the water, energy, energy, water nexus, agriculture in general is doing water, food, food, water, NSF is trying to integrate all of these things. And I, I just have to say, water and wastewater people are talking together. All you have to do is look, look at one water, the Water Research Foundation, the Water Environment and Reuse Foundation are all talking about one water. So they are talking, um, and uh, I see now the academies are stove pipe, just like NSF is and just like our academic brothers are. And I think what we have to do is to cut those stove pipes down and start talking laterally. Uh, and we're, doing, we're forcing that at NSF because I heard a comment about social, behavioral, and economics being involved. Every one of the uh, infused projects um, talks to geo, um, engineering, SBE and size are our cyber infrastructure people. So we are doing that, and uh, I think that we're making slow but positive progress. I would suggest if we could uh, 
delist two B-2 bombers, we could double the, f the, the uh, NSF budget. Uh, so we need to talk about the DOD. Um, but uh, it's obviously, it, the problem is we're flat funded and, 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 uh, it, and that's the biggest issue. Uh, no, there was a, before you, there was another question, so you can come back later. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. I think I, I have a comment rather than a question. I think um, the role of climate forecast, seasonal to interannual climate forecast in water resources decision making is totally under, uh, under score, underutilized. For example, we show a lot of drought and flooding cycle but you, we don't use that forecast, drought forecast, or flooding forecast to make use uh, in our water resources decision making. So there's a need to use climate forecast in our decision making. Right. Um, I, I, was, I participated in, uh, back in the 90s on the Yucca Mountain project modeling, which is uh, many of these coupling things were very obvious and, and uh, you know, trying to model the entire mountain, uh, which is, was a huge I mean, enterprise. But there was a lot of issues with the surface, with the valve transpiration. There were some climate uh, projections that they were taken out of the hat, you know, it's, uh, like 10,000 years from now it will be dry or wet or whatever in Nevada. And, and so there was, you know, it was not ex a very accurate with respect to that. But it, but it showed the complexity of the, of the task. But I think that with sensing and computing being so uh, the advances that we do that are so, so spectacular, I think there will be opportunities to do a lot more in these areas in a much, much better way. Can I, can I just clarify that I'm not talking about the climate in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. I'm talking about seasonal to interannual changes in climate. Yep. And there are, you know, NOAA is providing better and better forecasts and some places the signals are very clear. California, you know, El Nino, La Nina signals are very clear. In Southeast uh, United States, the signals are quite clear. But we haven't made much attempt to actually use those forecasts in our decision making, uh, decision making related to municipal water supply or demand or ag water users and things like that. If we start using those things, you know, we can actually not use as much groundwater or do a better job in growing different kinds of crops and things like that. I understand, very good point. There was a question here. Thank you, I'm Ann Coster and speaking of DOD, I'm actually with the Army Engineer Research and Development Center. And I kind of have a question that spans everyone looking at the energy, water, and food nexus um, and data scarcity. So, you know, DOD looks globally um, and a lot of the things that we're looking at is estimation of where conflict is going to be where the food and the water and all of these earth system resources are ending up. And so looking at data scarcity in, in areas of the world where we don't have the data, any kind of like strategies or insights into modeling and estimation of, of resources and management of those resources. Martha Mogadam again from USC. I uh, wanted to follow up on that comment uh, by noting that a lot of what we saw today had uh, modeling in it. There was some satellite observations, but I think most things that we saw highlight the lack of um, multi-scale data that we need, uh, whether it's for developing new models or for correcting the existing models and letting them propagate more accurately um, in the future. So we need in situ data wells, for example, sensors in the ground. We need satellites. Uh, Grace is doing a wonderful job. We need the follow-ons, uh, Landsat, MODIS, um, a lot of other uh, uh, satellite systems like SMAP, microwave technologies, which can actually see through the ground. And that's really where uh, we could be helped quite a bit by developing new technologies. Also aircraft systems. So having this multi-scale observation strategy is something we need to be looking at. Very good. Um, Elizabeth, would, would you like to say a few words, perhaps, from your perspective? Sure. Elizabeth, then I'll come to you some. Hello, uh, Elizabeth Ada, and uh, I'm with the academies, and I am uh, directing the Water Science and Technology Board uh, at this time, as well as the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources. 
First of all, it was an excellent session, and thank you for uh, inviting me. It was a pleasure to hear the, the various talks. There were a couple of comments um, speaking to, to Bill's uh, uh, remarks there in terms of crossing uh, different boundaries, trying to break down our, we call them silos of excellence, um, trying to, uh, to cut across the, the different silos, both, both internally here at the academies, because they exist, it's just a natural function of any organization, and, and also trying to bridge uh, across uh, for us, especially here in Washington, bridge across the uh, federal agencies and try to seek out uh, different um, interactions that we can have that will be positive because water um, is actually distributed, what is it, Bill, across 26 different agencies in the federal government. There is uh, some sort of water component, um, obviously some with a heavier, a heavier lift than others, but, but it's spread across many, many agencies because water in itself is something we all absolutely need. Um, so from the Water Science and Technology Board standpoint, we're certainly trying to look at those areas that we can help leverage, where we can help provide guidance and advice. Forums like this are very, very helpful for that because they help encourage conversation. Um, just a couple of items that might be of interest to some of you all uh, coming up. Um, the Edwards Aquifer was mentioned. That, that report um, is a three-part series. Uh, the second report should be released sometime towards the end of this calendar year, so you can keep your eyes open for that. That's a, the third report will be released in 2018. Um, there is also some work that we've been following and, and trying to help the conversations proceed related to some of the questions about multi-scale modeling, trying to combine um, climate models and precipitation models with soil moisture and so forth. And that's work with the national water model. Some of you may be familiar with that that began in, in uh, NOAA, uh, but is a, actually work that's being done uh, by a seri uh, university consortia that are combining cyber, uh, cyber infrastructure with uh, water modeling, Kawashi, which many of you are, are familiar with. And so the National Water Model is trying to combine some of these different elements together to look at continental scale hydrology, which is really a bit of a new concept because as you all know, water is very complicated and to try to look at it in a, a national way where we can, we can understand the, the flow of water and the behavior of water across the country. And so th that's something that's quite exciting that I think uh, would be worthwhile for folks to, to look into. And otherwise, if you have ideas for us where we can be more engaged in the water community, please, please feel free to contact me because we're trying to help integrate wherever we can working with Bill, colleagues at NSF, as well as at the other agencies. Thank you. Um, I would also like to ask Coralie perhaps to say something since she's the most senior person here in, in, in terms of NAE uh, um, hierarchy. Uh, well, my, since I'm not really into the subject here, I'll just uh, be uh, uh, very expansive and very brief. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming. This is really an outstanding a group of people, particularly I've just been observing, looking at the list of people that are here. Uh, I, I would have never dreamed uh, that we would have had this broad of a uh, perspective of people that have come here. So I just want to welcome you to, uh, to uh, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine with a strong emphasis on engineering. <laughs> so thank you for coming.